Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5 is where we're going to start from this morning and we'll, for the most part take our lesson from that. It's kind of one of those chapters you would be surprised if I told you we we're going to take an entirety of a lesson from that. Because basically it's just talking about the family of Adam. There's a lot of begots, there's a lot of uh, had this child, had that child, and then they died. But there are some very good lessons I think we need to take from this chapter. Uh, I'd like to echo what was uh, put up on the screen this morning uh, as far as from Julie and myself and uh, all, all the ones in our family. We thank you so much. I, I don't know how many of you uh, we saw come by in the, in, in the visitation this past weekend. Uh, I don't know how many texted Julie. She said her phone is just full of messages and calls that she received from you all. So appreciate that so much. Uh, we always try to do that for others, but as I always say, uh, when, it, when it hits close to home, uh, you really understand how important that is that we bear and share those burdens. So we appreciate that so much. Um, it's good to have God with us this morning. I think it said on the announcements he planned to be here and he's sitting right back there. Uh, he had a, had a driver this morning and uh, Jerry brought him on to church. So we're so happy that, uh, that he got him here. But it's good to see him. Uh, those exercises earlier last week must have paid off. So he's strong enough to be here today. And uh, Jeff mentioned as well, we've uh, had quite a few additions here lately. Um, Friday, it was just seemed like it was just my phone went, went off and then turned around and went off again, and we have two more babies. And uh, I, I texted Lisa, and I said, Oh, no, it's really showing out today. I said, We're having all kinds of kids. And, and just for, for just thought, I mean, you can sit where you want to, but if you're done having children, you may want to move from this section over because there's something going on over here. There's, there's a lot, that's a pretty fertile area right in there. So, uh, but definitely the Lord is blessing us, and uh, we look forward to getting to see these children grow up and, and one day see them serve the Lord. So let's definitely keep these families in our prayer. Today I want to talk about a lesson that's entitled Lessons from an Old Cemetery. And I know probably from the, the first glance at these pictures and, and the, the thought process of the title, you're probably thinking this is another one of those lessons about we're all going to die and it's one of those sad, depressing lessons. Really it's not. There is obviously death that is considered in it, but a cemetery is not only about death, and it's not only about, hey, we're all going to die. It's not one of those lessons. And I was reminded of that um, this past Monday as we uh, laid Julie's granddaddy's body to rest, of just how many lessons that we can learn from a place like that in life. It's not a fun place to go. Uh, it's not an enjoyable place to go, but it's a place that I believe we all need to travel through. And it reminds us of some of the more important lessons on life. The lessons that we're going to look at today are very simple and very to the point, but I hope it's something that we can all benefit by. And really, I, I started thinking about this as we were finishing up at Market Street with the funeral service this past Monday, and, and Ron was uh, honored and, and blessed to be uh, a pallbearer at his great-granddaddy's funeral. Uh, I don't know how many great-grandsons have that opportunity, but he did. Uh, we bought him a new suit for it, of which he wasn't too excited about, but we forced him to wear it anyways. And, uh, but we finished up at the funeral service and we were going out, uh, out the front there at Market Street to load the casket up and of course he didn't know what to do and, and I'm still in preacher mode and in funeral mode and, and all of that, thinking about everything that, that was going on and being said that day. And he tugged on my jacket and he said, Daddy, he said, I don't know what to do. I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, I'm a pallbearer and I, I don't know what to do. And I could see the, the fear in his eyes and I said, just calm down and I said, just follow me and I'll teach you. And, and what I realized right then was that we, we had hit one of those times in our lives where, at least in his life, it was a very teachable moment. So I had to switch from one mode to the next, and I just started explaining to him what we're going to do. I explained to him how we're going to pick the casket up off the roller and roll it into the, into the hearse. And, and then when we got to the, to the graveyard there uh, off of Hobbs Street in Athens, I explained to him how we were going to pick it up and tote it, uh, how we're going to go in and face it. And how that usually if you're doing a funeral or if you're a part of being a pallbearer, you always make sure that that head goes to the west and the body's facing east. And of course, he wanted to know why. And we looked about and talked about some of the traditional things with that. So I went into just talking about a lot of things that he and I never discussed before. And then I, I couldn't help but, but think as, as I see Lizzie there in this picture, of course, you see on the bottom, Ryan and I and the others are carrying the casket, but I see Lizzie and the other grandchildren, and, and at four years old, they're learning the concept of, hey, we're, we're not going to be here forever. And that one day, just as we came from dust, one day we'll go back to that and we'll be covered with dirt. That's just facts of life, and they're hard-learned lessons, and they're tough, 
And in many ways, they're sad, but they're lessons that we need to know. And as I stood there Monday in, in the graveyard, just observing a lot of different things, three things popped up into my mind that I think we all need to consider. And all of these come from Genesis chapter 15. It's a passage about life, but it's also a passage about death. And really, it's, it's kind of a, a, a scriptural graveyard, if you will, when you walk through this chapter and you see so many lives and you think about what all those lives mean. You see, a, a cemetery is not only about death, it's about life. It's about the uncertainty of life, but it's also about life itself, and it's about looking to a better life. Again, we talked about that the reason that we're buried in a certain way, traditionally speaking, but obviously it has reference to looking to a brighter day. There's passages that talk about the morning star and how he'll rise in our hearts. And traditionally, that's, that's why we bury people that way, and we talked about that. You see, there's a lot of hope in that. It's not all depressing, it's not all sad, and there's a lot of lessons that we can take from this idea. So I want us to take these three lessons today. If you're taking notes, the lessons are leaving... Living and looking. And that's going to be the, the body of our lesson today. When I sit in an old cemetery and just observe things around, I, I think about the fact that one day we're going to leave this earth. When you read through Genesis chapter 5, and I listed the scriptures there, or the actual verses where this is listed, but if you go back and count, I believe it's about eight times that the phrase, and he died, is listed in this chapter. Why is that listed so much? Why are we told repeatedly, and he died, and he died, and he died? Well, the lesson from that is that sooner or later, that's going to happen to us. We're going to leave this earth, and we're not going to be here forever. And we understand that concept. The reason being is because death will always be the punishment for sin. If you look there in Genesis chapter 2, and in verse 17, and we're all sinners sooner or later... It says there in Genesis 2 and in verse 7, But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Well, Satan questioned that in Genesis 3 and in verse 4 when he told Eve, you'll not surely die. Of course, I believe he knew the truth, and I believe that was his uh, big, strong effort to mess it up for us, and it worked. It worked. We're going to talk about tonight the plan that went into effect at that point and all the sacrifices that made our salvation possible. So that's tonight's lesson. I hope you'll come back for that. But that's where it all went into action right there, where they did eat of that fruit and where death, because of sin, came full circle. Death will always be a part of our lives because we're not perfect people. And just as it says in Romans 5 and in verse 12, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin. So it's just a fact of life. Death has reigned ever since. Of course, obviously God put a plan in place to fix that, but still, death has always been a part of our lives. So when you go up to an old cemetery, it's a lesson about leaving. And, and the, the thing about this chapter is when you read through Genesis 5, Everybody in Genesis 5 died except Enoch. But even still, his earthly life came to an end. It didn't last forever. And we've got to understand that. Hebrews 9 and verse 27 says, it, it, And it is as appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. It seems like that's more clearly evident for those of us who are older. But the younger you are and the more plans you have and the more things that you're trying to accomplish, a lot of times that's an afterthought. But death is no respecter of persons. A cemetery reminds us that we're leaving this place. Uh, the, the day that Julie's granddaddy passed away, I took off work that day and, and went to be with them and, and helped with some things around the house. And once everything was kind of situated, I, I had some extra time that day to try to get caught up on some things. And I... Uh, I had to take my vehicle over to the, to the tire shop to get some things done, and I went to drop it off, and he looked at me and he said, well, you don't have work clothes on. He said, what are you doing off today? And I said, well, I explained to him the situation. I said, I've just gone to be with the family. And he said, well, hey. He says, we ain't getting out of here alive, brother. And I thought, well, that's not much sympathy in that. <laughs> but he's exactly right. We're not getting out of here alive. One way or another, this whole earthly body is coming to an end. We're reminded of that. The sooner or later, death is coming. That's why it's better to go to the house of mourning. Not that it's fun. Not that it's more enjoyable. Not that anybody enjoys a house of mourning or a cemetery, for that matter. 
But just as Ecclesiastes 7 and in verse 2 says, It's better to go to the house of mourning than the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men. And what? And the living, people who are alive, should take heart that one day they're leaving. So what does that mean? Well, that leads us to our second lesson. And that is, as we close this first thought, the lesson is simply this. When you walk through an old cemetery, it reminds you that you need to be prepared to leave. Remember this phrase, no one is prepared to live. You really can't live until you're prepared to die. But when you're prepared to die, then boy, this life sure reaches a different realm, doesn't it? Amos 4 and in verse 12 says, prepare to meet your God, O Israel. Are you prepared? If you're prepared to meet God, then you're prepared to live. And that's what really is the second point is about. It's a lesson about living. When you think about walking through a cemetery, you, you see different dates, and none of them are the same. Very seldom do you find two that are exactly the same. And that dash between those dates may represent, obviously, different things and different lifestyles. But it's not all about death. It reminds you of the lives that people live. Many times on a tombstone, somebody may have uh, some kind of scene uh, etched into that that reminds you of their life and what they enjoyed and what they loved. Those things have meanings. It's not all about, there's just a bunch of dead people here. That's not all what it's about, is it? It's about the lives they live. And remembrance of the way that they spent their life here on earth. When you read through Genesis 5, you see that. You see people who lived 969 years like Methuselah. Or you see somebody who only had, and I say only because it was very small in, in contrast to the others, somebody like Enoch who only had 365. But what we understand from that is that death is a reality for all people, but it comes at many different ages. How we live our life is important because our time is so uncertain. Ecclesiastes 9 and in verse 10, if you'll turn over there with me, let's read this passage. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Very familiar passage, very often read, but very beneficial for us today. Ecclesiastes 9 beginning in verse 10. Whatever your hand finds to do. Again, this lesson is not all about death. It's about living. Verse 10, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Why? Because you're leaving. <laughs> That's what we just looked at. It reminds us that we're leaving, and because of that, it reminds us how we need to live. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, for there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you're going. You're leaving here, he says. So remember how you need to live. In verse 11 he also reminds us that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding, nor favor to men of skill, but time and chance happen to them all. We're all subject to time and chance. For as also a man does not know his time, like fish taken in a cruel net, like birds caught in a snare, so the sons of men are snared in an evil time when it falls suddenly upon them. There's a lesson of life and living found in every valley of death that we walk into. It reminds us of the fragility of life and how fast that it passes. It reminds us, as 1 Peter 1 and verse 24 teaches, that all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. What does that mean? The grass withers, the flower falls, and so will man. It doesn't matter how, how successful we are. It doesn't matter how prominent we are. It doesn't matter how beautiful the life. At some point, the flower falls. And so it is with us. Is that a morbid, sad thought? No. It reminds us of how precious every moment is and that we need to make the most of it. We need to make the most of it because we never know when it will be gone. It appears for just a little time, as James 4 and in verse 14 says, as a vapor, and then it's gone. Or it's just as it's talked about in the book of Job, chapter 7 and in verse 6, days in our lives are swifter than a weaver shuttle. They go by so fast. And they may be without hope in the fact that they're passing fast, but they can be filled with hope with the fact that we understand that we're looking to something else as we're going to look at in just a moment. So you see, when you walk through a place like that, we're reminded so often about the importance of how we live our lives. And it may be that it's a life that the future looks very bright. Again, we're very cognizant of the idea of these things when we're, we know that we're nearing the end of life. 
But when we're in the, in, the, in the height of our lives, when our health is good, when our ambitions are high, when the goals are right before us and they're all obtainable, they're just right there. When the future looks bright, we don't think about death. We have a lot of young people here this morning. We don't always think about death because we've got all these things that we want to do and all these things that we want to accomplish. And that's fine. That's, that's the drive that keeps us going. But we've got to keep our perspective correct. We've got to keep our perspectives in check because just as the rich fool was tearing down barns and building bigger barns and saying, hey, I'm going to live it up, that night his soul was required of him. Some die when the future looks bright. It's a lesson about living. What's the lesson? To sum up the second point, you might say this. Only the foolish live their lives with no thoughts of the end. I don't like to think about death. I don't like to think about the end. I don't like to think about leaving. But I have to think about leaving in order to understand how I need to live. And so we all do. What a foolish thought it would be. What a foolish process of life it would be for us to only think about the living and not think about what it's leading to. We shouldn't boast about tomorrow, for we don't know what tomorrow may bring. It's very uncertain. So that teaches us that we need to live today to the best of our abilities. And we need to strive to glorify God, because we don't know what tomorrow holds. We do, in part, know something about tomorrow, or at least someday in the future, and that is we look to a better place. When I think about a cemetery and I go back to what Ryan and I were talking about and, and the customary thing that we have to, 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 to bury somebody facing east, that, that they're looking to a brighter day or they're looking to the morning star who rises in their hearts. We don't know when the Lord returns. It might be in the middle of the night. We don't know. But there's some general consensus that, that it's looking to a brighter day. And that's why we customarily do that. But there's a lesson in that, and I, I tried to explain and convey that to him, that, you know, we're looking for a better day. It's not all about death. It's not all gloom. It's not all sadness. It's about a much better day in the near future. It's a lesson about looking that we take from a place like this. Again, as we looked at earlier, not everyone in this chapter died. And when you think about Enoch, Enoch was taken by God, and ultimately will all be taken by God. But I think there's, there's almost a play on words in a, in a very spiritual aspect that can be taken from his life. Death affects everyone, but it didn't touch Enoch. Why? Because he was somebody who walked with God. He was somebody who walked by faith, and therefore death had no power over him. Physical death didn't, but neither did spiritual. And I think that's a lesson to us in that as we look to a broader day, if you will, as we look to a more glorious day, we know that death does not have any power over us. Our physical bodies may die and, and our heart may cease to beat and we may go through a physical death, but much like Enoch, if we walk with God now, we'll walk with Him then and we'll never die. That, that's the significance of this looking part. I love the conversation that we have, and we'll look at that in just a moment, that Jesus had with Martha at the death of Lazarus. And we see just how important it is that we look for something else. But notice what Jesus said in John 5. John 5 and in verse 24, he says, Most surely I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but shall what? Shall pass from death into life. It's like it never stops. Many times at a place like that, many times somebody will say, it's not the end, it's only the beginning. The beginning of what? Looking to what? Eternal life. In a much better, more suitable place for us than here. Do we understand that? Do we, do we really understand, as, as Stuart read for us this morning, we appreciate him reading that, from 2 Corinthians 5, do we understand that it's, it's better to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord? I'm afraid a lot of times we really don't live our lives that way, but really and truly that's the looking part of that. Because all the faithful in that place of death that we so often dread going to, all the faithful there were looking to a better place and are now in some way, form, or fashion experiencing that. That's happiness, folks. That, that's not sadness. That is joy. And that's something that we all have to look forward to if we've so been washed in the blood of Christ. 
and if we lived a faithful life with Him. So it's better to be absent from this old body because in being in that state, we're present with the Lord and we all know that's better, right? Again, going back to the conversation there between Jesus and Martha. When Jesus finally arrived, Lazarus had, had already been dead for quite some time. They even said later on, but, but there's a stench. He's dead and there's no doubt about it. He's gone. But in John 11 and verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life, and he who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. I really believe that, that he, it pained him to bring back Lazarus that day because he knew he was in a better place. But he had to to prove a point. He had to to prove a point because he is showing that he has power over death. And that we have something better to look forward to. In verse 26, And whoever believes or whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Never die. How is, how is it that we never die just because we believe in Christ? Does that mean that our bodies won't decay and die? No. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about a spiritual thing. He's talking about eternal life. He's looking to something better and something greater. And he turned to Martha and he said, Do you believe this? And she said, Yes, I do. I do believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming to the world. The question is, do we believe that? Do we believe that? There was a time in her life where she had lost track of that, but not here. She said, I believe that. And she was looking to something far better. So what's the lesson in this for us? Enoch lived his life walking with God by faith. And he looked to God in his daily life. And the result? He was ready. That's the key. He was ready to meet the Lord. Matthew 24 and verse 44 says, You be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. When we walk through an old cemetery, I hope we learn that. And as we peer back into one in our thoughts today, I hope we understand that. That not only is it about leaving, not only is it about leaving, but it's looking to a better day. But the question is, are you ready for it? If you're ready, you can really look forward to that day. For he's coming at a time that we do not expect. I go back to that quote again this morning as we close. No one is prepared to really live. You know, we spend the, the, the biggest majority of our lives for the next step. You ever thought about that? We're always working for the next step, the next step, the next step, and it never ends. And I'm afraid sometimes, and, and I'm afraid even with myself, that, that I'm so busy trying to make it to the next step that maybe I'm not living for today. And it would be so easy to do that. We can't really live until we're prepared to leave. Kind of sounds odd to say it that way, but how true is that? No one is prepared to live until we're prepared to die. Revelation 22 and in verse 20, He who testifies these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. And John answers and says, Even so, Lord Jesus, come. You know why he could say that? Because he's ready to face it. We're going to talk a little bit tonight about why he was so ready to face him because of things he had endured. But Jesus says, I'm coming quick. So the lesson this morning is, is very simple. If you're ready, you will hasten that day. You won't be afraid of it. But if you're not ready, that day has a much different feeling. I've stood among families who were grieving, who within my ability, I had very little to give them any, any hope. Because this person didn't think about leaving. Because that person didn't think about how they should live their life. And they really never looked to the next life. They weren't ready. And that's one of the hardest things I've ever had to do in my life is to stand before a family. of Someone who, for what we can understand from their lives, was lost. And then I've got to try to give them comfort. That's an awful place to be. It's an awful place to be for me. It's an awful place to be for that family. And even worse for that person. You don't want to be there. I don't believe any of us want to be there. But if you are ready, oh, what a glorious day that is. For to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. This picture was taken as the funeral service ended for Ernest Adams. And Jamie may have a copy of this. I don't know if, if it was shared with him. I don't even remember who took it. But it was shared with me about a day or so after we 
Fred Ernest's body in the ground. And I don't know how long or how many times that, that I've looked back at this image and thought, that is the perfect scene to the ending of a good life. Served as an elder for so many years, served his community, faithful servant of God. One of the most beautiful scenes I've ever witnessed because the sun had set. Think about this. That picture to me says the sun had set on a faithful life. But as you stand in that old cemetery and as you look at that old casket and as you look at that sun setting, you know that sun's going to rise again. And I'm not necessarily talking about sun S-U-N. I'm talking about sun S-O-N. We know that he's coming back. And we know that He's going to rise up in our lives. And he know, we know that He's going to help us to raise. That picture does not say it's the end. That picture says, oh, what a day we're looking forward to. You learn that when you're standing in an old graveyard. The lessons are very simple. It's a lesson that we're going to leave. We're not going to be here forever. As the old guy at the tire shop said, we ain't getting out of here alive. That's the morbid thought. The encouraging thought is, well, I need to live accordingly. And I need to look for a more blessed day. As we often sing in the familiar song, Oh, what a day that will be. Oh, what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. One day we're going to see that. But you see that only if you're faithful. And you see Him face to face and you're in that better place. You're in that new Jerusalem, that holy city. Only if you've thought about leaving. Only if you've thought about how you need to live. And only if you've been prepared to look for that glorious day. And as we think about that this morning, as you think about those points with me this morning, if that means that you need to make some changes to your life, please do that. Time is so fragile. And you don't want to miss heaven. If you're not a Christian this morning, you need to be baptized. You need to become one. You need to repent of your sins, confess Christ, and go into that watery grave of baptism and be added to the Lord's body. The Lord's saved body, the people who look for a better day. Those who don't fear that valley of the shadow of death. Will you do that today? If you are a Christian and maybe you've strayed away, again, it's better to go to the house of mourning. And we've really not done that this morning, but we've at least thought about the lessons that we get from that. And if you see that there's changes you need to make in your life, do that today. If we can help you in any way, won't you come? while we stand and while we sing. <clears throat>